last class guys. We will not have any more lectures this semester, that is because I have an exam on Wednesday and Wednesday is officially the last day of classes. Uh, and uh, of course, your poster session is on Thursday, right? So, uh, Thursday and next Monday. The uh, reports are due over the weekend, as you know, and that is uh, and all homeworks and everything else, the, the drop dead date is pretty much the end of the week because there is no way we are going to be able to aggregate your scores and uh, score everything before the semester gets done. So, it is a uh, uh, otherwise, what uh, we will be doing, several of you really have uh, scored poorly enough that you are concerned about your scores. So, uh, we will be keeping the uh, homeworks up over the break again. Our intention is, uh, I made this clearer uh, early in the semester that uh, the idea is to evaluate you for your skills, not for your ability to maintain discipline. That is not my job, that is your parents, right? The latter. So, uh, on the other hand, we, we need deadlines, we need uh, timelines because otherwise nobody is going to graduate. But some of you will have horrible marks, get B's, B minuses, uh, B, B minuses and C's, and maybe a D. And for those of you who get those, who fall below the B, I, we will give you the option of. Uh, resubmitting all of the homeworks over the break if you do and uh, you will be able to improve your scores at least up to a B, right. I am not going to let you go beyond the B because that will be unfair for the students who got things done on time and managed to get an A, but it does certainly means that you get a chance to make up for lost marks and uh, catch up with the others. Again, the idea is that you actually, you guys actually learn the subject, it is not about discipline has required only because otherwise things won't get done, right? Anyway, this I'm assuming that you guys that, that all of you have been through uh, the two videos that were linked on the course website for because I couldn't do the last lecture on RL. Uh, the uh, uh, happy news for today is that the slides are not the are uh, video services and capturing the slides. So, if you are not actually watching the video and you hope to understand everything that went up from the slides that are being put up, you have a problem, right? And the quiz will be entirely from class uh, as always. So, uh, here is if you have been through everything that we have spoken of, here is everything that we have seen so far. Uh, we have these typical problem settings where you have agents trying to uh, to maximize the reward from an environment where the uh, agent takes actions which causes the environment to change state in an unpredictable way, the env environment returns rewards and the agent has to figure out what actions to take at each st uh, at, uh, in each uh, state to maximize their overall long term return, where the long term return is the cumulative reward through the entire process. So, situations like these when you are playing games, you are investing in the stock market, driving a car, so many situations. A dialogue system, you want to make sure that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, person engaging in the dialogue gets the response they want as quickly as possible, so many other situations, right? And here is how the, the uh, agent, that would be you, observes the world. That you start off with the system being in some state, you take some action, you get a reward and response for the action, but then the system changes its state in response to your action and the whole sequence proceeds. So, the, we define something called the value of each state of the system, which is the expected. Now, the agent has a policy which, which, which determines what actions they take at each time in each state. And the policy based on the policy each state has a value which is the expected return, long term return which is the discounted reward all the way into the future starting from there if the agent is currently in that state. So, there is a value associated with every state. We also define the value of taking an action in any state which is the value action pair uh, which is uh, which again is the expected return given that you are in the, in the state S and that you have taken an action A 
all of these have been defined. And uh, the objective of the whole process was to choose the policy that maximized your long term return. We uh, had, we, we, we noted four different conditions which can be partitioned along two different dimensions. The first is where you know how the environment, environment will respond to any action in any state. So basically the dynamics of the system are completely known. So that would for instance be this little toy example that we had where you know exactly how the overall system is going to respond and how the system state is going to change in response to your action. Or you might have the more realistic scenario where you don't really know a priori how the system is going to respond to your action. All you know is that you've taken actions and you're getting rewards. Then uh, the other dimension is that is this, you may have a predetermined policy. This is how I'm going to respond in every state. And then again, you may not have an, a, a policy defined in advance. Your, obje your uh, objective is to find the optimal policy that maximizes your expected returns. So you have these four conditions. And so if you have a model of the environment, you know exactly what the model and how the environment responds. This whole process was called model-based based planning. And if you don't really know how the model is going to respond, and this is something that's unknown to you, then the whole process was called reinforcement learning, where you're learning about the environment in the process of learning, figuring out your policies. So this bit is what we saw in the previous classes, where you know, there, there's a third dimension. And the third dimension is whether you actually see the environment state or not. So you know the state, you don't have to guess the state. And the alternative was where you don't even have a proper definition of the state because you're only partially observing the whole process, but we're going to assume that the two are the same. That's what we've done through this, uh, through, through the past couple of lectures, right? So we saw how model-based planning works. We saw the, we saw these two uh, Bellman expectation equations and the Bellman optimality equation. Uh, the value for any state. So a policy in any state defines a probability distribution over the actions that you will take when you're in that state. And so for any given action, you can define the expected return as the expected re reward for the action plus the values, expected values of the states that you will arrive at because this environment has changed from its current state as a, uh, in response to your action. So this one was the reward that you got for being, for taking the action A when you were in state S, the expected reward, you're speaking of expectations, and this, you know, having taken this action A, you're going to transition to one of the other states, and those states will have their own values. And so the, the return for this being, uh, for, for, the, uh, for the action is the immediate reward plus the expected returns from all of the states, uh, from the state that you're going to arrive at. And this averaged over all the actions gave you the value for the state. It was a closed form equation. We have a similar uh, equation which defines the, the value of taking a specific action in a particular state. And again, you got, this, uh, uh, you got this formula which said the value of taking a specific action in a state is the reward that you got in response for that action plus uh, the values of future states that you arrive at. So in fact, you will see that this term within the parenthesis over here is just this guy, right? So, uh, for any given policy, we could compute this because the values of states depend on the policy. But then this was the Bellman expectation equation. The second one was the Bellman optimality equation, which is a different equation. And uh, in the case of the Bellman optimality equation, you want to also find the optimal policy. And we saw that uh, if you defined the value for every action in every state, then the obvious thing, the obvious policy is to choose the action which had the largest value. And so this was the Bellman optimality equation which chose the action which had the largest value and the corresponding value itself was the value for the state. You also have the Bellman optimality equation for the, the say you can, you can define this for the state or the state action pairs and go anywhere right. So about the 
uh, question you posted on Piazza, right? Uh, now, so, and these cannot be solved in closed form because you have this max. And this can be solved in closed form because it's a nice little linear equation, right? Now, and so when we said the problem of solving a Markov decision process was this. You're given a policy. You have to find the value functions for each of the states. So that is one. That is a prediction problem. I'm telling you how, this, how you're going to respond in every state. What is the value for every state? And then there's the control problem. Find out what the best action to take is in every state. So there were two different problems over here. One is, yes. Yeah. So I mean that's not like a fixed action. It could be. That would be a delta, right? So that's that's assigning a probability of one to a specific action and zero to others, right? Yeah. So and control is the problem of finding the optimal policy. So we've sort of laid out all of the terminology. You want to see the various partitions, how we've sort of decomposed the problem, right? All of these accounted for this term here. Now, I'm assuming that if you've gone through the lectures, you know exactly how to do every one of these. You know the value iterations, you know the policy iterations, all of these things. We describe these, right? And so uh, this means that given the model for the environment, you know exactly what to do. The more interesting problem is this more realistic situation where you don't know how the environment is going to respond. So once again, you're going to assume that you know that the environment, you know the environment state. So it's not that you don't know anything about the environment. Obviously, uh, if you're playing chess, you know the chessboard state. It's not like you, that. You, it's not that you're peering at one little, uh, you know, section of the chessboard. Or if you're playing a game, you know the game state. If you're in traffic, you can assume that you know the traffic state. Or if you're in the market, uh, if you're investing, you can assume that you know the state of the market. What you don't know is how the system is going to respond to your action. So the real unknown is not the definition of the state itself. The actual unknown is the dynamics of the system, which means that these guys are unknown. These highlighted transition probabilities, which tell you how the, pro how the pro system is going to, the, pro the environment is going to respond in response to your action, those, that is unknown to you. And under this condition, you now have to go back and find the optimal policy. Or given a policy, there are two problems again. Given a policy, what is the value of each state? And how do you find the optimal policy? And you will see the, say, pro the challenge over here immediately when you go back to these previous equations. Here, the Bellman expectation equations where you try to compute the value of every state given a policy requires you to know these transition probabilities. And if these are unknown, this cannot be solved. So also the Bellman opti, what did I, what did I do? Okay. The Bellman optimality equation requires you to know these transition probabilities. Without these, these cannot be solved. So if you don't know the environment, if you're in the reinforcement learning condition, you don't know many of the parameters of the system that you will need in order to solve for it. But then, if you're in the situation, what is the most obvious thing to do? the most obvious thing to do is to just try to learn these dynamics. Because if you learn these dynamics, then the rest of it falls back to a well-known problem, right? You already know how to solve. We have the equations. We know how to solve for them. And so let's consider the first situation, where you're given a policy. You're trying to assign a value to every state. So this is the problem of prediction. But this is model-free prediction, because you have no idea what the underlying dynamics are, you have no model for the environment. And well, this is what we will do is exactly what I just suggested. You're going to first try to guess the dynamics of the system somehow. So, and for this, you can just record many episodes of this kind where you just engage. You're trying to find the value of every state for a given policy. So you already have the policy. In every state, you know how you're going to respond. So you engage with the system using your policy with the environment, and you run through many episodes. And then you try to estimate the values, state values or state action values, based on what you have experienced. This is like the spider going around the uh, cube and then trying to guess these things based on what the 
uh, on what it has experienced. And here we have a couple of different methods. Again, these things we have seen, if you have seen the lecture, which was the Monte Carlo learning method and the temporal difference learning method. Monte Carlo learning method was just this. If you ran through an episode at each time, you would be in some state and you have seen all of these rewards into the future. After having run through the episode, if you go, if you go back and reanalyze what you have done so far, then at each state you have all of these rewards into the future. So you can compute the average return. So at each time you can compute the return where the return is going to be the current reward plus the discounted future rewards. This would be gamma r3 plus gamma squared r4 and so on. That is the return at this time, right? The return over here is r3 plus gamma r4 plus gamma squared r5. Each, the return at each time is going to be the discounted sum of futures, current and future rewards starting from that point. And so you can compute the return at each time. And now the process has gone through some sequence, right, when you engage with the so environment. And so let's say in time, at time one you were in state SA and in time three also you were in state SA and these were the only two times you were in state SA. Then as far as you're concerned, the average return that you got when you were in state SA is going to be the average of G1 and G3 because of those are the only two experiences you have of the state SA. So in general, the value that you're going to get from these experiences is going to be the average of the returns that you get when you are in that state as you engage with the environment. Again, this is very simple, right? So you can do this for state action pairs as well. And that for state action pairs, any, uh, you're, as you engage with the environment, you're going to, uh, you're going to uh, uh, take actions when you're in each state. And so the, you can actually look at state action pairs. And here, for example, you were in state SA and took action AX and got the reward return G1. So there'd be, if you ran through this, there'd be other instances of exactly this pair. And if you took the average return of all of those guys, that's going to be your best guess for the action value, uh, state action value for that particular state and that particular action. Right? Again, this is a straight up Monte Carlo learning. Now, we saw there was a problem with this, that this, can, this kind of analysis can only be done post facto in the sense that you start with the policy and then you engage with the environment a few dozen times and only after you've engaged with the environment and you, you have to take a step back and only if you have this entire sequence can you compute all of these returns because the return is going to be the sum of the current reward and the discounted future rewards into the future all the way to infinity and that doesn't make sense. So you want to do something that's online and uh, so we saw that you can do this using temporal difference learning. The temporal difference learning was a very simple uh, modification to what we just saw. And this was based on the solution to a simple problem. If it actually come to class, we could have, we could have had some fun with the problem, which is uh, how do you solve uh, something like, uh, maybe you guys haven't, it's worth spending a little time here, right? So, uh, if you have something of this kind, A, A equals BX, right? Or uh, is, that the, is that the form that we've got? It's BX minus A. Yeah. So if you have something of this kind, and if you're asked to solve for this in your computer, right? But your computer doesn't have the division operator. How would you actually solve this? You're not allowed to divide. Yes. Pardon me, guess and check? Yeah, that's a good one, but you know, how much time am I going to take? I want a guaranteed answer. Just repeated subtraction, right? So you can basically, but then how would you do that? So you just, you can, you can write it like so, right? A equals A plus 
dx minus a. Or is that, is that how you write it? It's a, and take a look at the slides. This acts, so you can iteratively plug in the values of, wait, this has to be done in terms of x, sorry. I need this. Uh, So which is A equals. And so you can actually sort of keep repeatedly plugging in the current value of x. So x equals I can just write it like so, right? added and subtracted x. And so now, which gives me this, which you can show trivially, I can use this. This iteration is going to give you the solution for x. Provably so, but only if the factor a is less than 1, because this will give you the convergent series. right? And that's a lot of why, and that's something that we actually built on when we went through these solutions. Okay, so here's that's we're we're doing exactly the same thing over here. You have this value, which is the expected value of the return, which is the expected value of the current reward, plus the ex average value of this, the expected value of the state you're going to get to. And so you have this expectation equation, and you're supposed to solve for it. Turns out solving for this over a very large state space is going to be hard because you end up with a problem of this kind where you cannot really divide. And so you do exactly what we just suggested over here. You add and subtract the same term on both sides, right? And once you do so, then you get this exact, uh, what did you call it? Re repeated, repeated subtraction problem. And the repeated subtraction method is what we, what we use all the time right here. Okay, So that gave us this correction where you can say the current estimate, the next estimate is the current estimate plus a correction term, where the correction term is the error between what you should have and what you currently have. And if you don't want this thing to swing wildly, then you use actually you actually have a small scaling term alpha, which has to be less than one. Right. Uh, the uh, proof of this is very straightforward. It's on the slides. So there's a problem with this estimator. You're trying to estimate the v, but this first term itself has the target, which also has a v, which obviously cannot be estimated, right? So which means that. Uh, what we do over here is instead of using this expectation, observe that what we did here was to take the answer and subtract the value we wanted, right? So we're going to replace this expectation term over here with an empirical observation. But the empirical observation is the current reward plus the average values of the states in the future. And those two are not known. So you just plug in the current estimate of the values of the states in the future. And so that gives you this nice little update rule, which is based on this very simple formula out here, right? That allows you to iteratively uh, adjust your current values for this uh, for, uh, estimates for both the value of the state and value of state action pairs. So this gave us the temporal difference estimator. The temporal difference estimator is the value for any state you, is you, you incrementally keep correcting the value for every state. And the way you did it was this, that uh, you currently have a, you are in, the, you are, you are in any state, you currently have a value for that state. You think it's wrong. So you take an action, you get a reward, and then you get an expected value for this for future states, right? 
if the current value for the state is perfectly if perfectly is perfectly right then if you repeated this process a million times what you would find is that the average reward plus the average value of the future state is going to be exactly the same as the value of this guy right that's when you know that you that you've actually got the correct answer now if you find that the average reward that you get over here plus the average value of the states the states at the next instant are not exactly the same as what you have over here then what you would do is to subtract the differ add the difference between the two to the to the value to the current state so that's all you want to do except that you're not you don't have the option of running this experiment a billion times you have only one shot at each time so you're going to take the empirical observation that you got right here and treat that as ground truth and so here you have the immediate reward this is the only thing that you're going to have to anchor your beliefs in at each time the reward that you got right now is all you have to anchor your beliefs in and so you have the reward plus the average reward of the future states minus the value of the current state itself that is the error in your in your current belief about what the value of the state is you're going to adjust by that error except that you won't just swing wildly towards the current reward because that's too noisy you're just going to make a small correction where alpha is some small term just to make sure that you're not chasing the latest observation that you got and you do do the same thing for uh, if you wanted to get the state action values as well so this was a uh, the simple trick that we that we used to come up with online estimates as you keep running through the process at each time when you're in any state you're going to get some reward based on that reward you can correct the value that that you assigned to that state or you can do this for every state action value as well this term was what we called the td error which is the error between what you think the value of the state should be and what you experience as the value of the state and you, and and that and that is what you're making corrections by so uh, you had the there's a little algorithm that I'll skip right now this was uh finding this was how you'd find the values for states given the policy given the given a policy you're going to be following the policies for the state uh and for taking actions according to the policy and then once you take actions according to the policy then you can actually sort of use the monte carlo method except that you're not running things all the way to the end you're taking taking this one step correction mechanism to compute the values for the states now observe something over here we never actually explicitly model the transition probabilities the values are being obtained directly from experience without trying to come up with a model for the how the environment is going to respond but that information is implicit in the values that you got you're sort of sort of learning that through experience but you're not explicitly modeling it right so now the more interesting problem is control what we saw is how to compute the values for a given policy but then how do you find the optimal policy itself finding the optimal policy is a much more challenging problem right so that now the optimal policy is the policy that you will follow in every state to maximize your expected reward expected return in the long term right so here's the pro this is the problem of optimal control what we just saw so far was the problem of planning where given a policy you're trying to get the value right now we are going to learn about we are looking at control finding the optimal policy itself and so here your series you're given a series of episodes of this kind where you just run through the game your system your whatever process and when you run through this you're actually able to find the empirical returns at each time for every episode you want to find the optimal action value for every state and every action you need the optimal action value not just the optimal value because you want to find the optimal policy if you only compute the optimal value and not the optimal action state value for the state action pair 
then you will actually need the transition probabilities to determine what the Q's are uh, and, and determine the optimal policy. What we really want to learn is this guy. What is the value, expected value of taking an action A when you are in state S for every action? And then the optimal policy itself is going to be, pick this. And this is policy dependent. So what is this value under the optimal policy? If you have these, then you know the trivial solution to find the optimal policy is to pick the action for which this Q is greatest. You have a chicken and egg problem. To find the policy, you need the Qs. To find the Qs, you need the policy, right? So you want to do this, and you want to do this online. You want to learn these things online. So here's what. Now, if you will remember, we saw something. If you've been through the lectures, we, we saw something called policy iteration where in the policy iteration you start with some arbitrary policy and eventually compute the state action values for every state or you compute the values for every state using dynamic programming and then given the values you can actually you could actually find the optimal policy for every state by simply solving for this finding the actions in each state that maximized your expected return, given that you actually know the values under, the, under that policy, right? And now this policy is going to be different from the policy for which you computed the, computed the Vs. Now that you have the new policy, you can go back, go through the dynamic programming algorithm again, and re-estimate, recompute the values for all the states. And then once you've recomputed the values for all the states, from the values for all the states, you can go back and find the optimal policy and repeat the process till this converges. Obviously, this is very slow, because once you, for each time you compute a policy, you're going to have to go back and go through this prolonged process of finding the value for every state under that policy. And this is going to be particularly hard if the state space is very large. So we would like to collapse uh, both into uh, one step, instead of simply, instead of finding the values for all the states and then updating your policy and then going back and finding the values for all the states and updating your policy, can you collapse it? Meaning you update the policy, then you update your, the, your estimate for the values for the states and then you go back and update your policy and then update your values for the estimates for all the, for update your estimates for the values of all the states, except you're not going to try to estimate the actual value for every state whatever iterative dynamic pro programming uh, algorithm we use to estimate the state values, we will run just one step of it. So you update the policy, run one step of uh, the DP to estimate state values, and then using the updated values, you update the policy and so on. So you're trying to shorten the entire process. And so uh, that gave us this, the, the uh, uh, algorithm which looked like this, uh, which, that, that actually gave us the value iteration. But even before that, here's this issue, right? Uh, you found that if you uh, found the value for the current policy and then updated the policy for using the, using the current values, that wouldn't directly work. So here, for example, is a little grid, word, a grid world where you get zero rewards for being here. You start from here, but every action has a penalty associated with it. Every time you take a step, you lose a point. So you need to find a policy that gets you from here to here in the fewest number of steps, otherwise, uh, uh, otherwise you're going to lose points, except that you don't know this is what you must do, right? You don't know what the cost is when you start out of taking all of these actions. So you have to sort of wander around and so the game starts at the top right corner and you have to come, come down here. So let's say you initialize with a uniform random policy where you say, I'm going to randomly uh, choose the next move anytime in a, in a square and keep doing this. And of course, if you do this, you'll play a game, you end up here. Then you restart it, you end up here. You do this a few times. And based on all of these experiences, you can sort of come up with the optimal 
policy for, or you can come up with an improved policy for every square. And if you came up with an improved policy for every square, you'd find, for instance, that on average, when you moved down, you got here faster than when you moved left from the square. So, or was it the other way? No, on average, when you moved left, you got here faster than when you moved down. So you decide that the optimal policy over here is to move left. Similarly, you would find that if you're in this square, on average, uh, when you moved down, you got to the bottom, bottom left faster than if you moved in any other direction. So overall, so you find out that the policy, so you decide that the policy for this block is to come down, right? And so based on the, all of these experiences, you can come up with a policy for every square. But what happens? The problem is that in all of your experiences, you've never actually visited this corner. So the next time around, based on what you have learned so far, here are the policies you've learned. You don't know what to do in these two corners. You have some idea of what to do in the rest of these boxes. So now you use your updated policy and you run through the system. It doesn't, it, it, what you will find is regardless of how many times you run it, you're always going to use this procedure. And you would never discover, for instance, that the optimal policy is to go to the top left corner because in the top left corner, you know, movement out of the corner costs nothing, for instance, right? Simply because your experience has taught you that the correct thing to do over here is go down because in all of your experience, you never actually tried to move into this top left corner. So thereafter, you're stuck with the current policy, which is going to be suboptimal. So the uh, solution here is once you update your policy, you don't just follow it. You actually follow your updated policy most of the time, but a small fraction of the time you violate it. And so this was your epsilon greedy policy that we saw. Again, you must have seen this in the lectures, right? The model free control algorithm simply follows a policy, but then uh, you, f you start with a policy, and at each state, you're going to take an action according to that policy 95% of the time, 5% of the time you're gonna pick an action that's random. And then you keep running through your episodes. And then and online, as you keep through the process, you're going to keep improving your, you, you uh, run through several episodes. You learn about the values of the, of the various states. You update your values. You update your policy. But then once again, the next time you begin running through the system, you're still going to use this epsilon greedy policy where a small fraction of the time you actually violate your policy just for, uh, uh, to, to uh, figure out if there is something that you have missed. That's what you're trying to do, right? And so this was the so-called Glee Monte Carlo algorithm, which was greedy in the limit with infinite exploration. You're going to produce an episode, and then as you go through the episode at each state, you're going to update your state action value using this little rule that we just saw. And then for each state, you're going to uh, update your, you're going to have a new policy which says that you're going to pick the action which has the largest Q value. But then for a small fraction of the time, you're actually going to, a uh, small fraction of the time, you're actually going to violate that policy. Uh, you're going to take, take a random action. Most of the time, you will take the action that maximizes Q but a small fraction of the time you will take other actions and repeat this process. Now, again, the problem over here was when you do your updates, you don't know what this G is. This is the correction term, remember? And so uh, we saw something that we called Glee, or, or we saw something that, that, that was called Sarsa. Again, all of this is a quick recap of the lecture that you never saw, right? Uh, so <laughs> uh, something where uh, you would Start, with a st start at some state, take an action, get a reward, end up at a new state, and take a new action at that new state. And so what you would get was something like this. You're going to get state, then you take an action, you get a reward. You end up at S prime, you take an A prime. And so this is, this is the S A whose state action value you're going to be. Uh, your, whose, whose state action value you're going to be updating. And this is going to be corrected by some alpha times this reward that you just got 
plus gamma times q of s prime a prime because that's where you ended up minus your current state action value. This is the correction term, right? So observe the two things that are involved over here. The only real thing over here is this reward that you got because this is what you actually observed. This term over here is your estimated state action value for the next state and the next action. And this is the state action value for the current state and the for current action. And here is the magic. You don't really care what happened after you took this action. You only care for the fact that you took the action. And everything builds on the simple uh, observation that you don't care what happened as a consequence of taking this action A prime. You only care that you took the action A prime. Because you're only looking at, when you're updating the value for the current state action value pair, you're looking at the current state, the current action you took, what reward you got, where you arrived at, and what action you took over there. And the rest of it is kind of hidden, hidden into this QS prime A prime, right? And so this little thing is what you take advantage of. Again, so this is the simple update rule again, the SARSA rule. It's called SARSA because it's state action reward state action. Now, this is very similar to the online update rule that we had, right? Uh, except that instead of waiting to com completely find the value for every state, even as you go through the process, you keep updating your policy. That's all that has happened over here, right? Which means you don't need to explicitly store the uh, policies so long as you have the Q values from the Q values, you can actually decide what the optimal policy is at each state by just picking the action for which the Q value is largest. So uh, now, this is what well, we just spent 42 minutes going over, sort of summarizing what should have been covered in the previous two lectures. Right? Now you want to scale the whole thing up. If you want to scale the whole thing up, what happens? Let's say you have a continuous valued state. right? If you have a continuous valued state, how many states, or if you have something like a chessboard, how many states can you have? You can have a practically infinite state space. There's no way you're going to be computing the queues for every single state and storing it. So also your action space could be very large or continuous. You're not going to be able to store the queues for every action for every state. So in this case, what you really want to store is, uh, is a parametric function. You want to say, I want to have some function where if I give it the state and I give it the action, it's going to tell you what the value is for that state action pair, right? And that function has a parameter theta. And what I'm really going to try to learn is this parameter theta. So everything that we've done so far, we never mentioned neural networks. This is where they actually kick in. How, you are, this looks very much like it's an arbitrary nonlinear function. This is going to be a neural network, right? And to learn it now, you're going to, this is your Q function, right? F is your Q function. You'd just be using your standard gradient descent. You're trying to find the policies that maximize your, the value for every state, right? So in other words, uh, but let's say you actually know the value for every state, state action pair under the optimal policy. Then if you actually know the value for every state action pair under the optimal policy, then what is the obvious thing to do? You want to minimize the divergence between this F and the true action value. Right? And so if you want to minimize that divergence, then you could you you'd just be using your simple gradient descent rule, where theta equals theta minus some eta times the gradient, right? Standard gradient descent rule. Problem of and the function itself could be anything, right? The most common function is just a linear function that people use. If you have some continuous valued vector representing the state, the continuous valued action representing the actions then you think of the action value as, this is your model, right? As some linear combination of these guys. We won't get into that. 
but it could be something else. It could be a neural network. So this is most of the uh, real action these days is uh, using neural networks to compute FSA. Right? This could be something massive, convolution, a convolutional network. For example, if you're playing chess, you're not actually going to be enumerating every possible state. Instead, you'll just choose to use the image of the chessboard as an image, and then you can run a CNN on it. And that's, that's going to give you some output, and that's going to be your, uh, your, your, your Q function, right? So, and regardless, you're going to, you would still be using the same, uh, same uh, update rule. The problem here is that you don't really know what this target is. And so for the target, we're going to actually use the same thing that we used in TD in the sense that you would go keep going through the process, but then in the process, instead of saying that you have a current essay and I'm going to try to minimize the error between what I've currently got over here and what the true value is, I'm going to say I'm going to minimize the error between what I've currently got over here and this term, which is the updated value that I got after having obtained one more, re one more reward. Right? So this is going to be, uh, you're going to use this bootstrapping, where the immediate reward that you got in response to an action and the values that you get under the uh, best policy for the state that you arrive at, right? You're going to arrive at some state, and at that state you're going to have many possible actions. You pick the, you pick the most, the best scoring action. You get the corresponding F value, right? And this is the, this, this is going to be your approximate target. And you'd actually be using the approximate target to update your values. And uh, you can use pretty much any divergences, but then the, because these are, these values are real valued for real, then an L2 divergence makes more sense. So most commonly people will actually use an L2 divergence for, uh, for learning your thetas. Now, conceptually, all of this is very similar, right? There's nothing particularly complicated happening. However, this is doesn't act, this is not really gradient descent. This is semi-gradient descent. Why is this semi-gradient descent? That's because we don't really have the true value of the target. We have an approximate value of the target, right? So it's not true gradient descent, it's semi-gradient descent. Under some conditions, it will converge. Now, the problem is limited capacity. A table of Q values, if I'm just, say, storing Q values, QSA, for every state action pair, then that has infinite capacity. I can store all the details I want completely. It's just that the table is going to get very large. Now, if I instead I replace this Q function by this param parametric function, unless the number of parameters is actually equal to the number of states times the number of actions, I have a compressed representation. Now, what is the outcome of this guy? Suppose I update my parameters to improve the estimate of QSA for one given state action pair, it's going to affect the estimate of QSA for every state action pair because it's a parametric function, right? And this is a problem. That means that, you know, if you were using tables, I can go off and wander in that corner of the space, learn everything about the states there, and then I can come here and learn everything about states here, and learning about states here is not going to affect what I learned about states there. But once I begin using parametric functions, that doesn't hold true. When I'm learning over here, I'm optimizing my parameters for this region of the space I'm in, the, in the process I'm forgetting about what happened out there, right? So this is uh, what will happen, that as you're wandering around, let's say you initially learned all about this guy, and then you wandered out here and began learning about state action values for this corner of the state space you're going to forget about what happened in this corner, simply because the number of, para the, the, the uh, capacity of the function to remember things is limited. So uh, this means that you have to, it's not enough to sort of just wander through the state space, you have to make sure that every state or the vicinity of every state is visited frequently enough 
that it's not forgotten in the process. And so uh, there's the other thing, right? That the last thing that you saw is what you're actually going to be focusing on most of the time. And because you're sort of going through a sequential process, if you are going through a sequential process and updating your values online, your model is going to reflect your most recent experience a whole lot more than it's going to reflect anything that happened in the past, which is why things get forgotten. So the uh, first trick that you can play is to use something called a replay buffer. And what is the replay buffer? Here is, for that, you observe that here's what you really are interested in. You're just interested in this guy. You're interested in states. You're in a state, you take an action, you get a reward, you end up in some other state. From that other state, you take some other action, right? So long as you have any set of this kind that returned that, that, respond, that, that was arrived at, then you can actually use this. You already know that uh, now the reward depends, doesn't, doesn't depend on the policy. The reward depends on the action, right? And so you already know that uh, in this particular sequence, this is the reward that you get. So if you have a current estimate for the Q values at these two locations, I can update my parameters. And the updating the parameters is going to update the Q. But then I can keep repeating the process, right? I can keep, even for a single SAR, SA combination, I can run through this iterative process. I don't need that process. I, know I don't actually need to, uh, need to go through the entire process in order to make an update for one specific SARSA combination. So what we will do is this. You're going to go through the game or go through your system. And as you keep going, you're going to go. As you keep going through the process, you keep getting these SARSA combinations, right? You will store these. You're going to store this. You're going to store this. You're going to store this. And at each time, instead of updating your parameters for the latest SARSA combination, you're going to pick any of the SARSA combinations that you have already experienced and update your parameters. And you can do this because you only need to have the SARSA combination. That's all you really need, right? And by doing, and now the policy becomes, you're left with this issue of how do I sample things you know, do I just treat my entire experience from the infinite past to the current as one big pile? Or do I focus more on what is recent and less on what is past? So you can have sampling strategies for which of the SARSA combinations in, in your bucket you're going to use to update your parameters. But regardless of how you do this, eventually uh, you call that the replay buffer. You can just sample things and update your parameters. Right? It's a very simple trick. And this makes sure that you don't actually forget things in the uh, for, uh, forget uh, uh, things from the past. But then you're still left with other issues, and the other issue is that uh, you, the target is a moving target. So what do I mean by saying the the moving target? Right, uh, I'm actually uh, sort of. Uh, when you're doing online SARSA, you're using action values to compute updates to action values. So if you look at what's happening over here, you're using this action value to update this action value, which is a chicken and egg problem in the sense that you're using this guy as a given to compute the error. And on the other hand, if I modify the parameter to change this, that guy is also going to change. Right? So obviously, there's something broken about this in the, in the star sense that whatever I'm using as my approximation to the target is itself changing as a result of my update. So there's no guarantee that I'm actually sort of minimizing the distance to the target. I may actually be increasing it because that guy too, that, so, because in the process of improving this, I changed this and might have increased the, the distance to the target as a result. And so uh, the, 
this gives rise to this frozen target function where you actually two keep two copies of your q functions and you are going to compute this guy using one, one copy and you are going to update the other copy. Obviously, this is not a great idea because this means that you are always going to be moving towards whatever your frozen copy is and that does not make a whole lot of sense, right? So, what you will do is something like this. You are going to fix one guy and keep updating the other guy and then switch the two just so that, so, so uh, you would initialize your, you have two copies theta 0 and theta star, theta star and theta star is going to be the one that computes this term. Theta is the one that computes these q's which are, which, which you are correcting and so you fix one, you fix two networks or fix two functions. One function gives you the target and then you optimize the other function to go towards that target. Then after this thing is, has progressed, has, has sort of got, has uh, improved a little bit, you switch the two and keep repeating the process. It is still kind of a, a broken system in the sense that uh, eventually you sort of keep dragging back to where you originally used to be because you are always sort of modifying your current function to look like whatever you chose as the target, right? So it turns out though that this actually works very nicely. I won't go through this result, but this was the original uh, double Q network, DQN, uh, which uh, the uh, DeepMind guys composed to play these games like Breakout and, uh, you know, River Raid, Space Invaders. You might have seen all of these uh, videos. The actual algorithm that was used was very simple. It was just this very simple DQN function. And uh, as if you've seen the videos, this is what already five years old now, four years old now. They're amazing. They just learned to play this very complex game in a very short amount of time. And turns out those things are not sufficiently sophisticated. You actually had to improve them considerably to play smarter things like chess and go. Right? And so that's where you end up with this business of trying to estimate the policies rather than trying to estimate the cues. So remember what we saw so far, you are trying to learn a function that computes the q value, the value for any state action pair. And then at any state, if you want to pick the action that is most rewarding, you are going to pick the action that gives you the highest expected return, right? Now instead, uh, you can go directly to a function that just directly gives you the policy for every state without bothering to actually inter, uh, compute a Q function in the middle. And so these were these direct policy estimation functions or the policy networks and they use something called the policy gradient method. This one, this one is going to give you a probability distribution over the actions for any state. It is still a parametric function but it will take as input the current state and give you a probability distribution over actions. The earlier one gave you, you took it, it, it took a state and an action as a combination and it gave you a value. Here it is going to take a state and give you a probability distribution over actions which is your policy that you want to, want to compute. And this could be deterministic, it could be stochastic, it does not matter. The problem is that unlike in the case of, a, of the Q networks where you could, where the Q value was actually a real valued function. In the case of po policies, a policy is a choice, it is a selection. And so it is much harder to define uh, a loss function over selections. So to give you an idea, uh, if you have a discrete action space of this kind, then we have already sort of experienced this, right? For, ex for example, when you were training your attention networks or your language models. Uh, you found that if you chose a word and then you fed it back as the input, then the derivatives could not actually flow back through the business of choice. And that is why you had to do something else, which was, what was that? The gumbel noise, right? The gumbel trick was a reparameterization trick that actually allowed you to make the derivatives flow through a choice. Otherwise, there was no, there was no way of actually making derivatives flow through a choice. <coughs> 
Here, you're going to choose an action. And you have the same problem that, as you had over there, that you can't really now compute a derivative that goes through the action, right? You can't say, what would have happened if, I if my action were slightly different? Because a derivative is really saying, what is a small change in this guy? How does a small change in this guy result in uh, a change in my loss? And there's no such thing as a small perturbation of an action. It's a large perturbation. You choose a different action, right? And there are no numbers associated with it. So uh, the situation now is what happened? You're going to. Uh -huh. Wait. Awesome. My laptop is going to die at any moment, and I'm not sure why. So if it dies, we will stop exactly where it dies, right? You're going to recast the whole thing. Differentiation is an expectation operator. I'll, uh, and the class will end where the laptop dies. And the quiz question will be, where did the laptop die? <laughs> now, now, if I'm running through any state, I can think of this entire sequence of state, action, reward, state, action, reward as a trajectory. Through, a param uh, through, some, uh, uh, through the space of possibilities, right? So uh, the trajectory, of course, the reward is something the environment gives me. But the, cho the state and the choice of action, that is my trajectory, right? It's a, state, it's a trajectory through the state action space. And uh, if you choose the change the parameter, you're going to assign different values to different trajectories. Right? And if you change the parameter of your function f, it is going to change the trajectory itself and thereby the return. So the probability of a trajectory is a function of the uh, function, that, function that, you, that actually computes r. OK, so here's where we were, right? So this actually kind of makes it, here's the trick. Uh, So let's say you just ran through these uh, episodes, and you got a sequence of trajectories, right? Now the probability of a trajectory is a function of the policy that you have, right? Which is a function of the function itself, of theta, meaning if you change f, then which actions are suggested is going to change, and the trajectory is going to change. So. The probability of a return is a function of the trajectory, right? The, the return is a function of the trajectory, right? So basically, if you want to ex compute the expected return, you want to find the best policy, you want to find the policy that returns, that, that gives, the, you want to find the function f that maximizes the expected return over all trajectories, which means that it must naturally make more rewarding trajectories more possible and less rewarding trajectories less possible. Right? So the expected return is going to be just this guy. The probability of a trajectory, which is a function of theta, times the return that you get from the trajectory, summed over all trajectories. This you can define as the objective you, you, you want to maximize. It's a function of theta. You can manipulate this derivative a little bit. If I take a derivative with respect to theta, then this is the only term that's a function of theta. So you get, a, you get a gradient of the p with respect to theta. And then there's a standard trick where the gradient of a function is simply the function times the gradient of the log of the function. Right? This is a standard trick. I can multiply and divide the derivative with p, which gives me p times the derivative of p divided by p, which is simply the derivative of log p. And so, this derivative of the j with respect to my parameter ends up looking like this term, which is a weighted combination of the derivative of the log of the probability associated to trajectories multiplied by the return for the trajectory, right? which looks like the expected value of this guy. If you know, right? And once I think of this as an expectation, I can, I can compute an expectation through sampling, right? So this term over here 
the key point is what exactly is this log of the probability of a trajectory? That is simple again. If you actually compute the a trajectory is a sequence of state action, state action, state action. So the probability of a trajectory is the probability of the first state times the probability of an action which is given to you by your function times the probability of a state transition which is a function of the state and the action that you took and is dependent on the environment times the probability of the new action that you took and so on. If you take the log, you have the log of these guys are the logs of terms which depend on the environment and not on your function. This is the only term that depends on the function because your function only decides what actions you take. So when you take the derivative, these guys disappear and the derivative of the log of the probability of a trajectory with respect to a parameter is simply going to be the sum over every steps, all of the actions of the derivative of the log of the function computed at the action that you actually took. And this is a very differentiable function, right? Because the a's are now given to you. And so the uh, entire process simply gives you, uh, ends up being the expectation of the, the log of the probability of the trajectory computed by the multiplied by the return of the trajectory. This expectation can be replaced by a empirical summation, right, which is done by sampling. So instead of having the GT outside where this is computed over the entire trajectory and this is computed independently over the entire trajectory, you can sort of move the GT inside and say step by step you're going to factor in the return at each step. And this, you know, you can math show mathematically the two that uh, this two is correct, right? And this is just a sampling. This is an expectation that can be replaced by sampling. So if you want to see how that actually gets done mechanically, you go through an episode. At each time, you can compute a return. At each time, you have chosen an action according to the current function. So which means you already have this function, right? You can compute this derivative at each time because f is given to you. It's, it's, part, it's f, f is the function that you're computing. You have the function, you know its parameters. And so now this means that you can multiply this guy with, by this term at each time and take an average over the entire episode. And that's going to be your derivative of your loss with respect to your parameter. You can use this to update your parameters. Now observe that here you're trying to maximize the return not minimize the loss, right? This is a return. So this, act, this J is a return, right? So this is a gradient ascent rule, not a gradient descent rule. But then it turns out the whole thing actually looks like a maximum likelihood estimate, but it's not really a maximum likelihood estimate. In a maximum likelihood estimate, you have a bunch of observations. You are, so your observations are, uh, so this guy, log of p times g, right, is simply the log of p raised to g. The g actually comes outside the log here, right? So it's g times a times log b is log of b raised to a, okay, right? So log of p raised to g, which is like saying I have seen this trajectory p t g times, right? So this is like computing the log of the probability of seeing this trajectory this many times summed over and you're taking the expectation of this guy. And this is basically what you do in maximum likelihood estimation. You have some parametric form for your probability distribution. That's going to assign a probability to every observation. And so if this observation occurs n times, you're going to raise the probability of that observation by the number of times it occurs. You take the log, sum over all, ob and then you take the expectation of this guy over all observations, right? And that's your expected log likelihood. That's what you maximize. The key difference between this one and the standard maximum likelihood estimator is that in your maximum likelihood estimator, you're letting your observations come from real life. The probability is what your model assigns to the, this, this is what the probability that your model assigns to your observation. But the rate at which the observations arrive are, are from real life. So this sample sampling is going to be from 
the actual world. And this expectation, this probability is given to you by your model. Here there's a key difference. Here the sampling is also from trajectories that are governed by your model itself. So this is not a standard maximum likelihood estimator. This is not a maximum likelihood estimator. It actually just looks like one, right? But then given this, nevertheless, now we can actually sort of compute your uh, average, de your derivative as the average of these guys, right? Which we've already seen. We've seen how to do this. But then what is the point of doing this? If you look at something over here, because the sampling itself comes from the function that you're trying to estimate, not from real life, it has this habit of sort of sustaining itself, meaning it's going to uh, increase the probabilities of actions that your model suggested. Now in your maximum likelihood estimator, what happens? Your maximum likelihood estimator is going to increase the probabilities of observations that you got at the cost of observations that you didn't see. So if you're tossing a coin, every time you toss a coin, get a heads, you're going to increase the probability of heads, which means that you decrease the probability of tails, right? So your maximum likelihood estimator tends to increase the probabilities of things you saw based on things you, uh, at the cost of things you didn't see. Here you have this issue that the things you saw are dependent and by themselves on the function that you're going to estimate, which means that the function f is going to suggest that you see some things. So naturally you will see those, and then you're going to modify your function to make those more likely. So this is going to be a very unhappy thing to be doing, right? So to account for this, the trick is to emphasize trajectories with high return you want to reduce the probability of low return trajectories, but then uh, you want to do this with respect to what it is gaining with respect to what we currently have. So instead of simply increasing the maximizing log of f raised to g, you maximize log of f raised to g minus v, where g minus v is the so-called advantage that you get from taking a specific action. So you say, here is the current value of the state. But if I took this action, the, the, then the return that I get is going to be this guy G. And the return that I get from this particular action, if that's less than the value of my current state, then I want to make that particular action less likely. If it's more than the value of, that, of the current value of the state, I'm going to increase it. It's still doing what we originally, uh, it still has the same problem as before, in that it's still going to be self-sustaining. But then the gap is going to be much smaller. It's much less, un much less unstable, right? And so this is the so-called reinforced algorithm where you do exactly just that, right? Uh, but then it's unstable, right? If you start off with a function f, it's going to, tr it's going to like itself. It's going to keep liking, it liking itself. So to account for it, we do something called an action value function approximate actor critic methods, where you, when you compute the gain, the, the, the return, the return is no longer computed using what you currently observed, but you actually use two functions. One of them is something called an actor who's going through the process, and something called a critic which computes the values for the various states. And the two don't have to be, the two are not the same, thereby ensuring that your function f is not a self-sustaining function. So we are out of time, but these actor critic function uh, models are models where you would retain one model to actually compute the values for all the states. And that is what you're trying to improve over. And now the quality of your function f depends on how well your, action, your critic operates. But it turns out it's quite robust to the critic itself. And so then you have a whole bunch of uh, uh, learning rules <laughs> which you can derive from these, uh, from these estimates. Uh, we'll stop right here. Take a look at the slides. Uh, we've gone through a whole lot of stuff. We've go I've gone through, in four lectures, I've gone through what is typically spread over half a semester's worth of lectures, right? But then it should give you an idea of how the whole thing works. And even if you just went through these slides, in principle, you should be able to get some idea of how to begin to design uh, 
something like a reinforcement learning based framework for doing things, right. The sophistication and the details of that of course you'd have to pick up from something that from a course that focuses on RL like deep RL. But uh, what we've gone through over here is should probably give you some kind of a good basis for uh, how those particular models are learned. Now as far as we are concerned for this course the one topic that I missed yet again is VAEs. I hope to put up the slides for these. I don't think we'll have time to record it sometime in the next few days. And that will in fact be the first time I've put up slides of my own, not CAD slides. But uh, uh, the uh, uh, VAEs are something, are actually getting increasingly popular these days. And ideally, I really should have covered the topic as well. We'll stop right here. I assume that all of you are doing well with your projects. So if you have questions, post on Piazza and good luck. We have one final quiz. That's at the end of this week. The quiz will have things from today's lecture. So make sure to have watched it. Thank you.